ladies and gentlemen. From the beautiful Four Seasons Hotel in Toronto, welcome to the 113th season of the Empire Club of Canada. For those of you just joining us through either our webcast or our podcast or on Rogers TV, welcome to the meeting. Before our distinguished speakers are introduced today, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our head table guests. I would ask each guest to rise for a brief moment and be seated as your name is called. Please hold your applause until the final head table guest is introduced. These are our head table guests, beginning with Mr. John Chen, Executive Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Blackberry Limited. Mr. David Chekhov, Partner of Tories. Mr. William White, Chairman of IBK Capital Corp and a Director of the Empire Club of Canada. Ms. Amber Kamwar, anchor and reporter, Business News Network, and a director of the Empire Club of Canada. Mr. Michael White, chief executive officer of IBK Capital Corp. And Ms. Sue Vanderbent, chief executive officer, Home Care Ontario, and a director of the Empire Club of Canada. And my name is Colin Lynch. I am the vice president, strategy growth, and the executive office of Greystone Managed Investments, and the first vice president of the Empire Club of Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, your head table guests. We have a group of students joining us today from Centennial College as well as from Ryerson University. Students, please rise to be recognized. Thank you. In celebration of Canada's 150th birthday and our third event in our sesquicentennial series, I now ask our series sponsor, represented by Mike White, as well as our guest of honor, Mr. Chen, to join me at the podium and blow out the birthday candles while, our, while our, the remainder of our guests are enjoying our dessert. Over the past 113 years, the Empire Club of Canada has been privileged to welcome Canadian and international political leaders, policy thinkers, and chief executives of corporations, think tanks, and nonprofit organizations to the stage. Many have spoken of the critical role that innovation and technology plays in building the fabric of our nation. Today, this point has become obvious. We live in an age where technology has become integral to many aspects of modern life right down to the devices in our pockets. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Mr. John Chen, Executive Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of BlackBerry. John brings to the stage an impressive track record of leadership. John started his career at Burroughs Corporation as an engineer and held executive positions at Simons Nixdorf, Pyramid Technology Corp, and Unisys. He then served for, as Chairman and CEO of Cybis Inc. for 15 years an impressive feat, particularly in the technology industry, where he developed and led the company's reinvention from a mature, slower-growing technology company into a 1.5 billion-plus high-growth innovator. Under his direction, Sybase became the leading provider of enterprise mobility and mobile commerce solutions, achieving 55 consecutive quarters of profitability. But leading BlackBerry isn't enough. John serves on the board of directors for the Walt Disney Company and Wells Fargo and Company and is impressively active in the not-for-profit community as a trustee of Caltech, member of, of CFR, the national trustee of the First Tee, and as a governor of the San Francisco Symphony. Today, we are delighted that John will be joined in conversation with Amber Kamwar, a member of the Empire Club of Canada Board of Directors and an anchor and reporter of the Business News Network, appearing frequently on Business Day AM and the disruptors. Please join me in welcoming John and Amber to the stage.
right, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining. And John, thanks so much for giving us your time. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So we should disclose that in two days, BlackBerry reports there's, what quarter is it? I should know uh, this. Q second quarter for the year. Second quarter for the year results. So they are in a quiet period. So if you're expecting BlackBerry or John to announce that they are getting out of handsets, today is not your day. <laughs> Everybody stayed, so that's good. They're here for more. Uh, so speaking of handsets, John, what are you going to do with it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you said it's not a good day to ask me for that. You know, um, I don't discuss handset when it's rainy days. That's <laughs> That's a convenient loophole. I think Tori's might have helped you out with that one. So far, we're sticking to script. So far, yeah. But you know, I ask you that, and maybe we can talk about it in a more philosophical sense, because you, know, you read the analyst commentary out there. They're all wondering about this question. So maybe I'll ask it in a different way. Can BlackBerry survive without handsets? Is that essential to the core of the BlackBerry that you are trying to develop? Well, it's, it's kind of like, it's hard to answer that question because if I answer the question, I basically gave you the answer. Um, but uh, but let, me, let me think about the opportunities for what BlackBerry could do uh, on the series notes. Um, so BlackBerry, one of the things that attract me to BlackBerry um, is the amount of technology and intellectual property that BlackBerry has, in particularly the area of security. And so, um, and, and of course, handset is part of the whole thing. And, and I always tell people that the handset is kind of the entry point of our security, not the kind of standalone by itself. It, it's, a, it's a whole series. Behind the handset, we have our server technology. A lot of people know it's called the BlackBerry Enterprise Server. We bought a whole bunch of companies that enhance that security and mobile solution. Um, people like Good Technology and Watchdogs that do file collaborations and mm -hmm. um, Ad Hoc that do crisis management software. So there's a list of that. And, uh, and we have Booster that probably the most end-to-end, -end, most complete solution, both the hardware and the software. Now, gradually, what we have recognized the fact that the, mar the majority of the market is over there outside in Android, in iOS world. So all these softwares, we made it so that it could run on those devices and managing devices of those. Then, then behind that, we have these embedded technology, which a lot of you know we have own a company called QNX. Uh, the claim to fame QNX is to have the most secure and uh, embedded operating system. For those of you who are tacky, it's called a microkernel technology. There's a whole reason why it's most secure. That's part of the reason. Um, and it's in about 60 million cars today running around, active car running around out there in infotainment system um, today. Uh, now, in the last couple of two, three years, we invested in uh, advanced driver assist, we invested in telematics, we invest, invested in vehicle-to-vehicle uh, -vehicle communication, and the list goes on. And it's in Ottawa. This one, I think it's a, personally, I think it's a Canadian pride um, that, it, that owns this kind of technology and, and the market share. Now, what, the reason why you don't hear a lot about that is because we take that technology and we actually sell it to what they call the tier one. Tier one are the people like Panasonic, Harman, Danso. So they make the dashboards for these car companies and they install it, but the inside the dashboard is us. Except we re about a year ago, uh, we successfully unseated, or two years ago, we successfully unseated Microsoft on, in Ford and replaced a sync. So the, the current all 2016 model of you, like today we drove a Ford car here, or the rental car, um, and that has a sync, uh, all our sync technology in it. So, um, so those are the third layer. The fourth layer of technology and security is the NOx, um, the Network Operating Center. And, and uh, the good thing about BlackBerry, and this I cannot claim credit, I think Jim and Mike should claim the credit, um, they had the foresight to connect all the operators around the world. It's about 600 or so. Um, and using T1 line and using all kinds of you know, GRX technology. And, and we securely connect all these telecoms around so that we could transport messages. Um, we still own that, and it's the most secure NOx there is. It's the largest NOx outside of any telephone company. So, so those are multiple layer. And then throughout the layer, we have the IP. People are probably know that, again, this is a credit to the prior management, that um, 
we have roughly about 38, 39,000 patents around the world, and about 26% of them are in handset, and the rest of them are not. And the rest of them are really about security, uh, about encrypted code for those people who are student um, there, um, cryptology. Um, a company that we own called Sutacom is still the, the best technology, cryptological company there is today in the world. And we're beginning to license it. The one thing that I think when BlackBerry was doing so well, we missed the opportunity to commercialize a lot of these stuff. So the answer to your question is a very long way. Um, <laughs> And, and I have a lot of opportunity to grow the revenue of the company. We just need to set it up that way because you know, selling software, licensing technology are quite different um, and going to enterprise are quite different from you, know, you walk down to Rogers and pick up one of our phones. So this is, this is a completely different mindset and organization. And we've been busy in the last couple of years readjusting ourselves to that. You know, it used to be very easy to answer the question, what is BlackBerry? BlackBerry makes phones. So, I mean, based on what you described, you've got all these layers that are acting to be kind of this next driver of growth for BlackBerry. So if, I'll just ask you the question, what is BlackBerry today? Uh, um, it's going to be, a, enterprise, it's going to be a, a secure software company. And that's what percent of the way through are you? you? You came on board November 2013, so you had a couple of years under your belt. You were obviously brought on as a turnaround artist. What percent of the way through are you to achieving your stated goals? Two-thirds of the way. Two-thirds. Right. I, um, I started when I first came. Um, I don't know how many people knew that we were at the verge of kind of going away. Um, I, you know, I, probably I don't want to be overly dramatized, it, but it was extremely difficult. Did you know that walking into the room? Uh, I didn't know. I, I, I did know, uh, but I didn't know to what, what extent and what degrees. So it was it, worse it, when you walked in? Yeah, you always have this, um, you know, people like me is always, you know, you, you come into a situation, you look at that as a challenge, uh, and then you find out that you're very naive. Um, <laughs> And then you promised you won't do it again, and I did it three times. Um, <laughs> and so, um, so uh, yes, I, I, knew, I, I knew it was not lost on me. You couldn't be lost on you. I mean, there were enough people writing about it, uh, people like media that like to, you know, dumped on BlackBerry <laughs> and um, newspapers and TV series and, you know, and all that. Uh, anyway. Uh, so I knew that. So, so it was important for me to make sure that our team stabilized the financials, and we did. Um, you know, we recently refinanced our debt, and you know, we talk about it. it saved us fifty million dollars a year in interest rate. Okay, that fifty million dollars we could either report it as profit, or we most likely going to invest um, into this growth area. Um, I, I realized that um, I gave you the whole bunch of you know, and then and then I I, I know I need a strategy that is an encompassing of all the assets that I laid out. It's kind of a mouthful just now. Yeah. But what we really need is, I, I'm going to give you the, the view of the market. So everybody, you hear everybody talk about IoT, right? And, internet and of you things. Go, yeah, Internet of Things. You go to uh, and almost everybody, from telephone companies to technology company to automotive company, everybody said they're in IoT. To people that build houses, you know, smart homes and appliances and all that. So. So nobody is not in IoT. So it's kind of like if I tell you I'm in the business of internet, then you can say, OK, what in the world does that mean? Right? And what we want to focus on IoT is going to be the most secure layer of IoT. So now you take everything I just talked about, how you manage your devices, the software that transport the information, that's what we're going to do. We're going to be the backbone of communication for the IoT. And, and I think that, if we are successful, could really grow a big company out of it. So, um, that has identified. We align up to execute it. Now we need to start seeing some growth. So what is that? You said you're two thirds of the way. What does it take to get to the finish line? We just need to get it done. OK. <laughs> there you go. I mean, right now, I don't think there's any, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll make some investment. Um, but by and large, it's now about getting it done. I mean, it's, not, it's not about. You need bits, piece. You need a new idea. It's not about it. I need the money. 
I think, I think for, I, for the people who are interested in BlackBerry, and I hope most Canadians are, uh, this company is safe. Um, I was negotiating my debt, and um, I'll give you a little tip that it's not really a, a big secret or anything. Part of the negotiation, obviously, negotiation always go back and forth, right? Uh, there was one point in time of the negotiation that we were stuck on some terms, and I literally said, okay, then forget it. I know I'm just going to pay the entire debt. And I realized afterwards, when I said that, it was not said in a very boastful or a bluffing way. It was, you know, I realized that all of a sudden, BlackBerry has the ability to pay off the entire debt, which was $1.25 billion. Uh, and, you know, two, three years ago when we first came in, we didn't have that ability to do that. Um, and so this is a company now um, financially is well maintained and controlled. We had made investment over a billion plus, been acquiring about five, six different companies, or in software or in security. Um, and, um, and so now we need to execute it. You're making a bet, too, that security is going to be the, me, the, the main driver and the key differentiator of why a business chooses you as their platform versus any of the other competitors. And, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of them. I guess my question is, do people... A lot of the security company? Did you say there's a lot of them? No, no. A lot of people that are playing in Internet of Things as software, yeah, not yeah, necessarily yeah, yeah. pushing right, right, as right, security. Right, right. So your bet is that that security right. layer is going to be the key differentiator. In this environment where you're hearing about hacks every other month and they kind of just roll off of people's back, how sure are you that, that people are going to pay for that, that companies are actually going to invest to make sure that they are secure? Well, that's a good question. Uh, they, they, they have to. Um, uh, let me uh, provide a few things. I know there's a lot of people from Bay Street. You work for financial firms. I think your regulators is going to insist that you show certain level of cybersecurity. And by the way, mobility is not a choice. So you need to go find the best mobile security solution, and you got to come to us. <laughs> now, why, why, do you, why, do you, why do you need to come to us? Uh, you know, if you look at the latest Gardner report, and I, I would encourage you all to look at it, and I'll ask your CIO to do so, okay? Uh, they laid out the most secure mobile solution Six, uh, it was six critical items. We're number one in all six. Okay, there is no other company. So, where one of our guys uh, marketing said that they were trying to come up with, I don't know how many people see that um, uh, Fronase commercial. You know how they, the, the the nose spray that gets you. Uh, Are you guys allergy. getting into that? Allergy? As well? No, 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 <laughs> no. That commercial has something very interesting. They said six is better than one. I'm trying to steal that line. <laughs> So uh, they have six different ingredients in it. You we'll look at that commercial. Google, okay. Google it. You know, you mentioned the Gardner data. The Gardner data on on certain platforms will also show BlackBerry losing market share. And Absolutely, I they hate us. <laughs> um, and I'll follow through on my question. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, I got my good friends at Gardner here in town. Uh, you know, I mean, it's good to have a difference of opinion. Um, I think in some cases they're biased. Um, uh, a lot of the analysts are people, all right, and they could get it wrong. Uh, I could get it wrong. Uh, the only thing I could do is to do the best we can. I mean, I'm, I'm not there to win the popularity contest. The fact that if you read the Gartner reports two, three years ago about BlackBerry, you will never see anything positive. For whatever reason, historical reality, perception, whatever the reason it is, that, that you have to accept. Um, but Today, they have something good to say about BlackBerry. I'm not saying that, therefore, we have everything is great, <laughs> but that's progress, and, and that's progress that a company should feel good at, about, and, the, and, and we work hard at it. But it, it kind of feeds into this perception where some people are still waiting and hoping for that old BlackBerry to come out and be a competitor to the likes of Apple, Google, Samsung, and you've taken a different approach to those formerly competitive relationships, maybe just flesh that out a little bit more, and why people who are waiting for that, for you know, the iPhone killer to come from BlackBerry, uh, might, might be waiting a very long time. Well, um, there are a couple of things. I think um, being a, so 
in business, I found through all these years, um, if you look at a business strategy <coughs> as an emotional, in an emotional way, most likely you always lose. So this is not a religion. I love every one of you to get your BlackBerry back, and I know some of you still uses it, but some of you are probably closet iPhone user. <laughs> um, you know, I have my staff using FaceTime, and they would like, you know, <laughs> by mistake said that to me. Oh, I FaceTimed somebody yesterday. And, and I look at them, I said, FaceTime? I didn't know we have that app, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, and the most embarrassing is uh, sometime when I went to uh, dinner with friends and you know their spouses and all that, and they would say, uh, you know, take a big picture. Well, this is a great picture. Let me airdrop it to you. <laughs> airdrop? My goodness, you know that I don't I don't do airdrop. You know, BlackBerry. I keep telling them airdrops are the most insecure way of transferring stuff. Uh, anyway, <laughs> let me answer the question this way. I really think about it as the surf available market. If we are building secure software to secure all the endpoints, you as an individual should have all the choices. You should, whatever phone you want to use, whatever devices you want to use, whatever you want to use uh, Alexa for, from Amazon, you control whatever endpoints you want to control. I should be able to be, a, be a, your, you know, a supplier to you so that you could use my technology. Now, if I restrict it to just BlackBerry phone, I just kill my surf available market think that's not a way to look at a business. I could do that. I could hang on to it and say, you know, all my real application could only run on BlackBerry. Now, we do have a set of application only run on BlackBerry devices because of security. And not because we want to restrict it that way, because it's very, very hard to make iOS and Android, you know, follow our protocol to make that secure. So for the government users, for banks, uh, it's still better to use the BlackBerry devices. Uh, so. so that's one of the reasons why I, we, I did branch out. We do encompass everybody. But if you're in the Internet of Things, it's about consumer choices. And, and I cannot say that, oh, BlackBerry is going to build you a washer and dryer. BlackBerry is going to build, you know, I mean, it's not going to, it's not practical. Um, so the, the most, most secure washer dryer. Hmm? The most secure washer dryer. Exactly. So, so, so what? <laughs> You will never lose your clothes. Is, uh, is, is, is that where the next uh, wave of growth is going to come from in mobility is software? And not just for BlackBerry, but there's this notion that you know, the handset market has kind of reached peak saturation. It's become commoditized. So those kind of growth rates are going to be very hard to come by. Are we now in an era where you want to play the things that can grow on the saturation of, of smartphone? Yes, I, and I want to use, take advantage of the fact that there's a huge install base out there. Yes. Last year when you uh, were rolling out the PRIV, I asked you how you spend most of your time. And you said most of it is, is with carriers, negotiating with carriers. And, and you felt maybe people don't appreciate how much time you're spending doing that. So what do you spend your time doing these days? Uh, end user customers. Um, I've been to, you know, talking to bankers, uh, government CIOs, uh, mostly those, um, being Wall Street all the time, and you know, uh, well, you know, if you look at the infrastructure of most of the company uh, on Wall Street, most of the firm, uh, they're all BlackBerry based. Uh, you know, anywhere from Bank of America, Citi, um, you know, J.P. Morgan Chase, SoftGen, you know, the list goes on. Um, so I'm spending more time with them uh, directly. And I think the carrier have two reasons for it. I, you know, I have a lot of good friends that run carriers. Um, and, but our business case and their business case and the reality of the market actually does not line up. The carrier are, not, are, are less and less interested in selling you cell phone. Hmm. They used to sell you cell phone because they want to use that um, to, to entice you to their plan, uh, to the uh, subscriber plan. They're less and less interested in that. If you look at the carrier business case, that doesn't make them money. And, and I think over time, and, 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 and we're not the market leader for any stretch of imagination. So for them to, to get excited over this, this relationship, other than you know, having good meals together, um, that doesn't make sense. Uh, so, 
So we, we need to work on things that make sense. Now, some of the carriers and us are working on cars together, you know, the uh, autonomous driving mm -hmm. cars, uh, the telematics to the autonomous driving car, the connected cars that need security, don't want, to, don't want to be hacked in. We're working on that. Now, that excites them, okay? but that's their growth, right? Just, just like myself, I'm excited about our growth. They're excited about growth. And, and so going back, doing the so-called, you know, type approval and rolling on, on handset, it, it's, it's difficult to even, for me to expect them to be very excited. So spending a lot more time with customers just trying to get um, BlackBerry software in enterprises. When you first came on uh, board, I think all the press, all the media was looking at, okay, what's, what's gonna be sold and how fast is it gonna be sold and how much is uh, BlackBerry Messenger worth? And, and most analysts were looking at BlackBerry, some of the parts. If you broke it all up, this is what the company is worth. And instead, over the course of your career at BlackBerry, I think all you've sold really is the, the real estate. Yeah, real estate. Real estate. Yeah. And instead, I still you, got some more if you like. Okay. You know, <laughs> uh, and instead, you've you've been doing acquisitions, a, a string of tuck-in acquisitions, a big one, in good technology. So is BlackBerry today more likely to be a buyer of assets or a seller of assets? Oh, we're we're not we're not selling assets. I mean, to monetizing assets. Selling is not. I mean, if I if I couldn't find a way to grow the business and make money. Of course, we will sell it, uh, and um, but we're, we're not uh, anything core to us from the strategies I laid out to be the most secure platform for all the interconnects. That's none of those things will be sold. We might partner. We signed an agreement on BBM Consumer in, uh, in, a, in a major media company in Indonesia. We have about 60 million monthly active user in Indonesia, so we own the market in that sense. Uh, and we want to extend that to get more active users, to get active users spend more time on it, and to create an advertising model. Um, I'm not going to break out the number, but it's somewhat, I mean, it's from zero to something that Above you, zero. You, you, to something that I think you'll be impressed, but, but hard to impress you by not giving you the number. Um, but just trust me, we are building that business. And, and so, but that, that, the, that particular transaction was a licensing transaction exclusively to them. Uh, I would do that, um, but we're not selling BBM, or I still own BBM.com, um, the name, the brand, and everything associated with it, and the technology. So we will do more of that, um, because the fact that in order to get BlackBerry back in the market in a hurry, um, we retreated quite a bit in the last three or four years, our necessity. Now I need to use the ecosystem to get it back in it. So I don't intend to fight Samsung or Apple on handset in a mature market head on by saying, oh, I'm going to open up five shops and hire 1,000 people. I think that's, uh, if, I, if I get there, somebody should examine my head. <laughs> um, I, I think that's, that's not high probability. The margin of the business doesn't justify the risk either. So, so anyway, so, so the point is this, you know, we're not, we're not seller, we are buyer. Under what conditions would you sell the company? Under what condition I sell the company? <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, well. Don't look at your I, lawyer. I, I always have, I mean, I, I always answer the question this way. Um, when the price is right, I will. Um, but, uh, but the shareholder needs to get a huge reward for the bet they're, they're putting in right now. Some of them are long-term patients shareholders. They need to get their money back. So and I think we still have a long ways to go. And are you, th are you there for the long haul? Oh, that is up to the, the board of directors. I, it's, this is not a self-employed business. <laughs> I can't say, yeah, I'm going to be here forever. Uh, I, I think the board, um, the board has to decide on whether they want me to be here long haul or not. Um, I signed a five-year agreement. This is public information. I, I signed a five-year agreement. I'm two years and 10 months and how many days into it. <laughs> uh, but um, I'm about halfway. You're about halfway and two-thirds of the way complete? Yeah, two-thirds of the way complete. Um, when you um, 
came on board and people were just getting to know your background here in Canada. Of course, a lot of people knew you from the tech world in the United States. There was a lot made about what you did at Sybase and the turnaround effort that, as Colin mentioned, it took 15 years, so it certainly wasn't overnight. Um, and a lot of people said, well, he's just going to do that uh, with BlackBerry. Maybe spell out for us in what, in, in what ways the Sybase situation was different from the BlackBerry situation. Well, my approach is not different. The company always are different, right? Sybase have um, a um, pretty sticky install base uh, in financial trading systems, equity trading systems. Um, and then they, and it has a, a kind of sticky maintenance um, uh, revenue. Unlike our you know, service activation fee that BlackBerry, my number one pain point is that the old, tech, old revenue is rolling off. Mm -hmm. And I call it the, the Apple theory, the Newton theory, meaning that you sat underneath the tree and something hit you while you're reading a book. It's gravity. I can't stop the gravity uh, because it's the market. Uh, what I could do is to replace what I lose in, in, in the, the erosion uh, and get the company back financially sound. And I think we're beginning to do that. Um, and so, um, uh, so anyway, because of that, those are the differences. That one has sticky revenue, the other one doesn't. However, the thing about BlackBerry that is more exciting, in a sense, is it has all these assets that we just talked about, including intellectual property. And I think it's aiming at the market in the right place. At Sybase, it was easy to get the financial back in check, but it was harder to grow to an adjacent. At BlackBerry, it's harder to get the financial in track, on track because the, the revenue keeps rolling off, but it's a, so much assets at the right part of the market, it's actually easier to get to an adjacent to declare victory there. So this is very different, uh, but you've got to have patience in both cases. So are you saying on the intellectual property that you're looking to monetize it, in fact, turn it on for BlackBerry's purposes, or you would be, I know you said you're not a seller of assets, but are you looking to sell off some of those IP licenses? Um, it, it, it a little bit depends. Um, I don't have, when I say monetize, I really meant licensing. Okay. I, I don't mean selling. Um, selling is a one-time event. Licensing, hopefully, is an ongoing. Canadians, I think, when they hear the word BlackBerry, there's kind of um, there's some sadness associated with this company that has really fallen from grace. You've felt that. You've seen that in press coverage. What should Canadians feel about BlackBerry today? Oh, I, you know, I guess actually, I mean, this is serious. I'm not joking. Um, one thing that surprised me is how um, BlackBerry have lost a lot of the Canadian support. Um, I, I, that surprised me. And, and I would always thought that you know, this is an iconic brand. It represents a lot about the history of technology and innovation of this country. It's been the number one for a long time. It was the best brand in the world. Um, and, and yet, um, you know, when I, when I started this effort of rebuilding, um, I run into all kinds of problems uh, with, you know, a lot of different, you know, I'm not going to name the names, but I was surprised. And, and um, uh, what I think the Canadian ought to think about is, if you really truly believe in innovation and knowledge, it's the next plateau of the revolutions of the economy, or the evolutions of the economy. Um, Having a healthy BlackBerry is actually paramount important, not only to the Waterloo areas, um, to the you know the the you know the innovation centers and all that. Um, the mindset and the history we already lost Nokia, uh, Nokia, uh, the Nortel, sorry, mm -hmm. Nokia lost too. But, uh, <laughs> we already lost. That was for uh, somebody else. Uh, we already lost Nortel, and from um, a industry observer point of view. Um, that, in my mind, was very unfortunate for Canada. And um, it, it had been a rivalry to Cisco, and it was being healthy for the market. Um, and I don't think BlackBerry goes away. That's anything for um, Canada or the industry at large. That's my personal view. 
Um, and so I think we should, I mean, BlackBerry should do the, do the, do the work. I can't expect other people to do the work for us. Um, but, um, you know, some level of support and encouragement, uh, I think it's going to be a win-win for all. That's my opinion, but um, we're, still, we're still working on that. Okay, well, maybe let's move something uh, less controversial, Donald Trump. That was not a controversial. <laughs> that was not controversial, you're right. You're a card-carrying Republican. I think if uh, history had gone a different way in several respects, you, you might uh, be working for an administration, but you're not. Um, we have the debates tonight. What do you make? I don't have the debate. You don't. No, they have that's the right. Debate. They okay. have the debate. So I guess we'll be watching. Um, what do you make of, of Donald Trump and his chances as somebody who is a Republican? Um, I could only refer to what I have publicly stated. Okay, um, and I had an interview a little while back, actually the same week at uh, Republican National Convention. Um, that that particular week in July, and I was interviewed, um, and so on records I. It's there. So, um, I, yes, I am a Republican. I think I'm, I'm a Republican because I am financial, economically moderate, and, and conservative. I think that's the part of Republican I am. Uh, I do believe that you, know, you need to generate more than you spent. So deficit is not a good thing. Um, it doesn't matter what the economic theory behind it's meant. Eventually, it's not a good thing. Uh, maybe if for short term, maybe OK. Um, and, um, and I think the taxation strategy that as Republican laid out, as Donald Trump laid out, I think makes sense to get more business flowing. I, I would buy, buy that. It's, uh, as a immigrant to the United States um, and a minority, it's very difficult for me to sign on to his platform. Um, I think he uh, sharpened the divide of people, which is never a good thing. Um, I, I think he, I, I, I get the feeling that um, he often say things to wow people, it's just irresponsibly. You know, building the war and have Mexico pay for it was an interesting <laughs> phenomenon, whatever, proposition. Uh, I, I think that's, unfortunately, in my personal humble opinion, is degrading um, and, and somewhat condescending. So I worry about the foreign policy side of the equation uh, and the domestic policy. So it, it's going to be very, very difficult for me to support him. Interesting thing, once I put out that article, uh, that interview, um, I immediately got email from my good friends in Washington. As Amber put it, I, I was quite connected. I was on... Um, on, on Bush 43, uh, a number of commission and, and so forth. And I was on the export council uh, for the United States for a while. So I got up front and close to anything re related to a free trade agreement um, at, that, at that era. Sorry, at that era. Um, so um, I got this uh, email and say, I guess you're not moving to DC anytime soon. <laughs> so I guess I, I just politically. Uh, murder my own career, Chancellor's <laughs> career, uh, yet again, uh, now on Canadian television. Um, but <laughs> but I, I think I've given up on that. Since I'm going to employ myself at BlackBerry forever, I think it's OK. Uh, yeah, but, um, you've got that Canadian citizenship, citizenship uh, yeah, I, waiting I, for I, you uh, if you turn around actually, the company. After, after that conversation, I probably do need to seek asylum <laughs> in, uh, in Canada. Uh, but. Anyway, so uh, I don't know how I drifted off uh, this topic, but uh, in, in this case, I, I found it disturbing. I hope I learned something tonight that changed my mind. Um, I hope he was just doing this to, to uh, win the nomination, but so far it hasn't really worked <laughs> since the nomination. I think we just have a few minutes left, but at this point I wanted to open it up to the floor just to see if we have uh, one or two questions. Does anybody have a question they'd like to ask John? Maybe about handsets? <laughs> There's one over there. You, you mentioned, or at the outset, it was mentioned you're on the board of Wells Fargo. Um, obviously, a sensitive situation there. 
Uh, you know, the, the cross-examination last week from Elizabeth Warren was vicious. Do you have any comments just more broadly about, uh, you know, the, the view towards corporate America from, from the government perspective? Um, Amber already tried. <laughs> uh, on the day... <laughs> you want to say it? I don't know. You go ahead. You're <laughs> on the, the storyteller. <laughs> on the day, on the, day uh, the settlement was announced uh, with OCC, um, Amber already emailed me. And so my answer to everybody's question is, since everything is going on, I'm going to refrain from making any comments. Um, it's probably legal counsel would advise that. Um, <laughs> so I'm sorry. I, I don't really, I shouldn't be talking about this at this point. Anybody else? One more question? I think we're, oh, we're going to end on no comment. Oh, wow. <laughs> OK. Thank you, John. Well, thank, thank you so thank you. much for your time. It. And thank you, everybody, right. for joining us. I'd like to welcome David Chekhov to thank our esteemed speakers. Well, thank you. And I have a brief, uh, brief thank you to express to John. But before doing so, I think it was really um, special that all of us at the head table were introduced. And Amber almost got John to blush. So I'm now going to try and get Amber to blush. I think there's a person here that deserves special introduction and recognition, which is Amber's father who here, who's here today with us. So please, if you'd uh, stand for us, thank you. Oh, you're, well, my apologies, and Amber's mother, thank you. It's very special. You'll have the opportunity to get back one day when you go ahead with that interview with me. Well, look, when I first had the pleasure of meeting John on, on his very first day of work, I was so impressed by his open manner, uh, humility, and his approachability. With John, as you've seen today, there is no arrogance nor any bluster. And as his remarks today illustrated, he possesses a deep understanding of the markets in which BlackBerry operates, its customers, and the competition. And John's passion, effort, and leadership, in my opinion, have led BlackBerry to now becoming the global leader in enterprise software and security. And so, John, I'm confident that you have the necessary skill set to continue, continue to lead BlackBerry down this path, this journey, and this new direction, and to make all of us here as Canadians proud. So thank you. Well, a sincere thank you to our generous Sesqua Centennial Series sponsor, IBK Capital Corp., and to our event sponsor, Tories LLP, for making this event possible. Without sponsors like these great companies, the Empire Club lunches would not be possible. So thank you once again for your support. I would also like to thank our, the National Post as our print media sponsor and Rogers TV, our local broadcaster. We'd like to thank MediaEvents.ca, Canada's online event space for live broadcasting today's event to thousands of viewers around the world. Although our club has been around since 1903, we have, very fortunately, moved into the 21st century and are very active on social media. Please follow us online at empire underscore club and visit us online at www.empireclub.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and virtually anything else online. Finally, please join us again as we have some extraordinary events scheduled over the coming weeks, including Mr. Alan Belmar, President and CEO of Bombardier, on September 28th, that's Wednesday. Ms. Darren Lavelle, the head of school at the Bishop Strawn School on September 29th, that is Thursday this week. And MPP Patrick Brown, leader of the Ontario PC Party, next week, October 6th. Thank you to our uh, esteemed guests. It was a wonderful lunch. Thank you for your attendance today. And this meeting is now adjourned.